Hi there, my name is Jessie Fry. I'm the Worldwide VD for Amazon Recognition, and I focus on identity verification and fraud prevention. And hello, I'm Mike Ames. I'm a principal AI services specialist focused on identity verification. Back to you, Jesse. Thank you. Um, so in today's session, we'll be walking you through how to evaluate an identity verification solution. But before we do that, we would love to hear your experience uh, with regards to the lack of identity verification and how it's potentially impacted you. Talking of which, Mike, um, do you have an example you'd like to share with you? I do, actually. Um, in fact, I was talking to my father-in-law about this um, very episode this morning when we went for a walk. So my father-in-law um, is a 90-year-old retired professor, and he was in a uh, victim of identity theft. And essentially what happened was he fell for one of the tech support scams. He was having trouble with his printer and... Um, reached out to what he thought was a tech support person. And the person actually installed some software on his computer to help, you know, navigate the issues he was having. And it wasn't about until two hours into the conversation and uh, working with this supposed tech support person that my father-in-law realized, uh-oh, something's wrong. And in the end, it wasn't a huge loss. It was just a few thousand dollars. Um, the scammer basically was able to get into his bank account and um, transfer funds as well as buy gift cards. And um, the real issue just kind of came down to his loss of trust. And I think this is where having identity verification, especially um, in the financial services space uh, for elderly folks, you know, comes into play because if there had been some form of um, validation, maybe some sort of biometric, like, you know, having a camera snap a picture of his face and compare it to what was um, what his face looked like when he registered, you know, could have prevented a lot of this um, from actually occurring. So that's kind of what happened to my father-in-law. And, you know, he still talks about it to this day. It happened a few years ago, but it's still kind of sticks with him and um, just doesn't quite have the trust that he once did um, when dealing with folks online. Anyway, no, that's my story. Absolutely. I think this is a fantastic story. And, and, and I think a lot of people can definitely relate to it. So thank you so much for sharing. And for anybody online who has a story that would like to share, we'd love to hear from you and interact with you in the comment section. So please just type your story and, and we'll have a little chat um, as we progress through this presentation. All right. Well, with that, let me give you a brief overview of our agenda for today. So we will walk into understanding identity verification, essentially what it means to your business. Uh, and we'll do so by kind of highlighting the key uh, identity verification steps across uh, different journeys. We will then move on to providing you a little bit more context around the impact of the lack of identity uh, verification and the business challenges uh, involved. And of course, moving into a little bit more detail with Mike walking you through uh, the evaluation of the identity verification solutions, as well as uh, best practices and metrics to ensure that you set yourself up for success when evaluating a identity verification solution, but also when measuring its impact within your business and your customer experience all the way through to um, how to integrate identity verification. We've mentioned uh, in previous talks that identity verification can be implemented standalone or amongst other uh, AI services. And so we'll kind of give you a bit of an overview of that uh, and some existing solutions we can share. And we will close out with next steps. Now, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So please do interact with us in the comments section uh, and we will answer your questions as you go. Alternatively, you can always um, save them for the very end as we will have some room for Q&A too. 
All right, so what is identity verification? Well, very simply, it is the process of taking a selfie and comparing that with what's on file. Now, as you can see here in the workflow, you have this lovely lady who is taking a selfie of herself, although she's chatting through it. And that is then being compared to what's on file. Now, this picture that's being compared with a 98% similarity score is taken from her driving license. So what's great about this is uh, recognition takes uh, um, the face from the driving license using a bounding box and then stores that on file as this lady is taking a selfie that is then being cross-referenced to said picture on file and returns with a similarity score in this instance of 98% uh, certainty that it is the same person. Now, uh, this is fantastic uh, identity verification workflow that can be applied to uh, know your customer, uh, anti-money laundering and other use cases, which I will proceed to walking you through. Now, Looking at some identity verification applications, Amazon Recognition um, offers pre-trained and customizable computer vision capabilities to essentially extract information and insights from your images and videos. Now, some of the most common applications of recognition include using facial comparison and analysis in your users onboarding and authentication workflow to essentially remotely verify the identity of opted in users. Now, some key applications include customer onboarding and ongoing verification, and that can be found in banking applications. So when you're trying to log into your bank, you're trying to make a payment that is above a certain threshold, and you want to have that added level of security to be prompted to take a selfie to ensure that you are who you say you are and not uh, someone else taking over your account, or even when you're logging into your phone using your face. Um, now, branching into virtual proctoring, uh, you are also, uh, we see also uses of uh, facial authentication for exam takers. So allowing uh, folks uh, the ability to take exams remotely um, and ensuring that, of course, it is a secure and focused env environment through uh, onboarding supervision. Another key uh, use case that we're seeing is the gig economy uh, in the gig economy space by ensuring that we authenticate drivers at the beginning and throughout their shift uh, to ensure that there is no account landing, no impersonation, and of course, to result in a safer experience for the rider or uh, the recipient of a particular food delivery or delivery as a whole. And last but not least, another um, industry I'm seeing identity verification uptake is uh, in the event and airport checking space using facial authentication to move through the process faster so onboard your flight much faster checking into an event much faster and of course keeping us all safe as it is contactless in nature so why is identity verification important well we have seen and continue to see that fraud is a challenge. It doesn't really matter what business you belong to. Uh, every year, studies continue to paint a relatively bleak picture, especially in the account takeover and identity theft, which are both on the rise. Now, the impact is not only uh, to the business's bottom line, but also to their reputation. Now, just to try and quantify this a little bit more, for every dollar in goods and service stolen, the impact is another $3.8, which is almost four times. And of course, the untold uh, challenge of the uh, reputational damage in the age of social media, uh, global knowledge about a problem is, of course, near instantaneous, which is difficult to manage uh, and, and deal with in the context of uh, damage control. Now let's take a look at some of the key challenges and reciprocal benefits of implementing AI services for identity verification. Firstly, costly operations. Uh, it is expensive to implement and develop your own algorithm. Implementing identity verification using our AI service means it is ready to use and thus helps you reduce your overall operational costs, whether it is through implementation or further down the line uh, with our pay-as-you-go charging model. Secondly, 
data and process complexity. Recognition is a fully managed service, which means it can easily integrate with any other APIs. And that means that you can get more insights out of your data. Third, there is a lack of ML expertise in the market. As it is, as we mentioned, ready to use, it also means that anyone can quickly implement it and integrate it within their workflow and reap its benefits that can be done through our cloud formation templates or relying on resources such as myself and Mike to help walk you through that journey. With that, I will be handing over to Mike, who will be walking you through how to evaluate an identity verification solution. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Jesse. Let's talk about how we can evaluate an identity verification solution. And I wanna kind of bring this up that at the end of the day, these biometric face-based identity verification, it's all about similarity. So as we saw before, um, this gal taking a, a picture of herself, a selfie here, the solution actually does a similarity comparison between the two faces, the, the one that she's taken on her phone and then the one that's on her driver's license. And we get back a similarity score. So keep that in mind as we kind of walk through these next set of slides, because it's really important to understand we're making a decision that these two faces are the same person based on a similarity score. So understanding similarity. By now, almost all of us have had some experience with COVID. So let's use that as a way to understand these predictions, right? So if you've ever tested, right, you take a test and it comes back with a prediction that, hey, you are positive. But if you weren't sick, that's what we call a false positive. The test comes back and it says, hey, you're negative, but you turn out to actually be sick. That's what we call a false negative. In a biometric system, we have the same kind of confusion matrix. And if you're like me, I call it a confusing matrix because it's hard to remember sometimes what actually constitutes a true positive and a false positive and a false negative. But as we make these determinations based on similarity, the comparison of a face, to either a trusted source or to a collection of faces, we're making that prediction based on that similarity score that, hey, this is actually the person we expected or it's not the person that we expected. And then in between, there are those false positives and false negatives. And so we're gonna see how the similarity score is used to make these determinations. When we start to look at the underlying similarity scores when we're doing face-based biometrics, right? There's that similarity score between the face presented and the comparison images. So we're gonna get back a similarity score. And based on that score between say zero, perfectly expecting that it's not a match, all the way to 100, which basically says, hey, this is 100% um, probability that these are the same two people. Somewhere in there, we make a decision with a threshold. And for most identity verification solutions, we set that threshold relatively high, you know, 90, 95, 99 plus, right? Depending on our business case. When we set that threshold, we're gonna make some decisions. Hopefully most of our decisions identify true positives and true negatives, but there are gonna be cases in aggregate when we pull a large enough sample that we actually produce false positives and false negatives. And so to the right of our threshold will be true positives and false positives, right? These are people um, that the faces have a high enough similarity that we're going to say that they are a true positive, that they're the same person. To the left, right, we're going to predict that you're an imposter or that the faces don't match. And of course, we're going to have some number of actual non-matches, and then we'll have some number of matches that, should, um, that shouldn't uh, be made based on the similarity. And those would be actual 
genuine people that we're basically saying are different. So understand the distribution of that similarity score. And so we start to look at things like the false rejection rate or a false negative. This occurs when the solution considers two or more images of the same person to be different, right? And this would occur if the similarity score is less than the similarity threshold. And the two images are of the same person. So here in our original example, we have a score of say 98, right? Well, if our similarity threshold is 99, then we would say these two people don't match and we would reject their presentation. A false acceptance might occur, right? If the similarity of the two faces, so here I have two different people, but their similarity score is set at 98. So they're very similar faces, right? Two images of different people to be the same. And that's what we would call a false positive or a false acceptance. And depending on your application, you would have slightly different um, impact as to whether or not you accept, you know, two people are actually uh, the same person, right? So a false acceptance, that's another thing that we wanna look at. So the false rejection rate says, hey, how many, um, times does the solution consider two images of the same person to be different? Now, in the case of, say, onboarding a new user to an application, right, the cost of having a false rejection may be relatively low, or it could be pretty high, but it might just be the risk of having to do additional checks. It's the false acceptance. That's when the solution considers images of different people to be the same. That's one that we really try to tune for. And depending on the application again, right, we don't want to have um, the application actually identify different people to be the same person. So we set our thresholds extremely high, right? So the false acceptance rate, that's the false positive count over false positives plus true negatives. So just kind of putting those two evaluation metrics out there, kind of consider, right? These are the two key measures that we look at when evaluating a uh, identity verification solution. Of course, there's a trade-off between the false rejection and false acceptance rates. So if you remember, we're always looking and making decisions based on a similarity threshold. So as the threshold increases, say going from 80 to 90 to 95, our false acceptance rate is going to go down, right? We're going to have a much more restrictive um, policy in place. While at the same time, our false rejection rate, the number of times we reject genuine matches, goes up. And so depending on the application need, you know, maybe it's a gig economy type of thing where you're, you know, doing an in-car camera snap of a driver right? Maybe your application needs to be less restrictive because you're going to compare multiple images, you know, throughout the day, right? In which case you can kind of lower the similarity threshold and lower the friction on yourself. By comparison, suppose you're at an airport and you need to verify the face presented versus say a passport. right? In those cases, maybe we want to have extremely restrictive decisions. And so we would crank the similarity threshold up and we would be okay with potentially rejecting and causing more customer friction or user friction by having the higher similarity threshold. So if there's one kind of key takeaway from the thoughts around evaluating these things is think about those similarity thresholds and the decisions and the impact that they're going to have on your application. So with that said, here's a couple best practices, and I've put together several um, identity verification solutions over the years, and some things that I've learned. One, use a large enough but reasonably sized sample of images. You don't need to use millions and millions of images, but also 
having 10 images is not helpful. So picking, you know, a representative sample, you know, maybe 10 or 20% of your population is probably a good starting point, right? Of course, if all you're looking to do is prove out a solution, yeah, you can get away with a much smaller sample. Carefully review open source and synthetic data face, uh, uh, synthetic face data sets, excuse me. Um, there's a whole host of open source images out there and they're great for benchmarking solutions, but nothing compares to actual images that your application captures. And so some data sets that are out there um, they might be biased towards one population, one demographic that your application may never see, right? They may use different camera technology. The images, sizes, and pixels may be completely different than yours. All of that needs to be taken into account. Of course, some of these data sets are great for getting started and building an application with. Just be prepared that as you get closer to deploying an application, you may want to do it with real images and run the evaluation process there. Another thing is avoiding manual and synthetic image manipulation. There's a whole host of applications out there that will allow you to dither images. You know, I personally like to age images a lot of times to say, what would this person look like 20 years from now? That's a great way to, you know, build up a construction data set, but in the real world, for the applications that are deployed, you're not going to see a rapid aging of somebody. You also find that people like to look for edge cases. And so they'll sometimes generate edge cases um, by manipulating the images manually. And again, it's not real world. And so sometimes the similarities and metrics that come back are not what would be expected in a deployed application. Four, review image quality over time. What we find is that, especially when using cell phone cameras or even cameras that are deployed in a lobby, the technology is constantly changing and the camera technology is getting better and better and better. And so at day one, you know, maybe most of your images in aggregate, you know, the sharpness and brightness scores or the size of the image right? Might be, you know, not great, or maybe it's good enough to get started. But six months, a year later, somebody comes out with a net new camera, all of that quality, right, is going to change over time. So you have to kind of constantly monitor and measure how your application is performing. And you go right back to this false rejection and false acceptance rates. Most of those drastic changes in those things can actually be traced back to image quality and underlying application behavior. Finally, utilizing a human in the loop. We are making identity verification decisions. And while, you know, the whole goal is to automate a lot of manual processes, we do need to have a human making and helping, especially those edge case decisions at a minimum, providing a way for somebody to come in and say, well, why did I not, you know, why was I prevented from registering, right? You can go back and see, oh, you know, the face on your driver's license no longer matches the face that you have today. So having that human in the loop to provide that, that expert guidance is important going forward. So briefly, let's talk about integrating identity verification into existing applications. The AWS ML stack, you know, we have this three layer stack that starts at the infrastructure. And then we have, you know, things like SageMaker in the middle. And at the top of that stack, we have our AI services, the pre-trained, pre-built machine learning and AI services that allow us to take advantage of the latest advances in computer vision. So our portfolio starts off with pre-trained APIs, that's recognition, image, and video, as well as text track. We have the ability to do also auto machine learning and custom data processing. So we have things like recognitions, custom labels, 
right? You want to build your own computer vision application. That's a really simple way to get started in computer vision. Amazon Lookout for Vision. And then you can also get into custom machine learning models using something like Amazon SageMaker. And then we have a whole host of deployment um, capabilities from deploying at the edge or to simply just deploy in the cloud. So bringing everything together, here's an example architecture that's used in identity verification. A user presents a selfie, right? We use Amazon AWS Amplify to deploy a web application that allows us to activate a camera on a mobile device or on a website. And we can take that selfie. We can also take an image of say a driver's license, goes through an API gateway, triggers a Lambda process, which then calls something like Amazon Recognition Services. And in within Amazon Recognition, we have things like compare faces, which actually will go in and compare the faces in two different images. We can also extract text from documents using Amazon Text Track. There's an API called Analyze ID, which actually not only will extract the relevant text features off of US driver's licenses and passports, but it also will classify them. So we'll know the document ID, the first name, the last name, the date of birth, the class of license, right? All of this can be backed with Amazon DynamoDB, lightweight NoSQL data store for really fast integration. So that's how we can kind of bring this all together with a really simple architecture. And of course, we can get quite complex as we go along as well. So let's look at this in action. So here, and I'll just play this video and talk over it. Here, I have a user that basically captures a photo of himself, right? And then he goes and he registers, gives himself a login, gives him his first name, his last name, a date of birth, right? And then when he signs up behind the scenes, that's going to give him a registered user, right? The next piece goes out and says, hey, I'm gonna register a new user and he's gonna present an ID card. And so here, he's going to capture a photo of himself, as well as capture his passport, right? And so when we do this, the user will capture their selfie, provide their user ID, and then TextTrack will also extract all of the pieces and parts off of the passport. When he selects register, Behind the scenes, the application will compare the selfie to the passport, come back with a similarity score and a decision based on that score threshold to say, hey, this is a registered user and he's been validated, assuming his similarity score scores high enough. Let's see what happens when somebody tries to sign in right, to an existing application using their face. So here I have an imposter user and he attempts to log in and he will get a failure to log in because ultimately his face doesn't match the face on file. Right. So as we look to provide those near frictionless experiences for customers, right, that automation of this process becomes important. Similarly, if we were to attempt to register a user with a um, ID card that wasn't theirs, right, an imposter user. Here, the solution goes out and it matches the face to the one in the passport, it comes back with a similarity score that's gonna be less than our required similarity. And we can see here, 
the faces don't match. And so the registration attempt fails. Jesse, back to you. Key customers paving the way. Thanks, Mike. Let's just take a look at some of the customer success stories we have in store for you. The first one I'd like to highlight is Aela Credit. Now, Aela is a fintech company built to simplify instant credit and payment solutions for emerging markets. Now, Aela wanted a better way to validate employees' ID and government-issued IDs in real time without the need for human intervention. Now, as a result of their identity verification workflow, uh, implementation, which essentially focused on facial expression analysis and facial comparison of government issued IDs, they went from 5,000 users to 200,000 users in just a few months. This really kind of highlights the power of implement implementing identity verification and what it can do for customers like Ayla Credit. Now let's look at Bashpan, Bancho, and Dolan. In partnership with Capgemini, Bashpan, an organization focused on children's rights, launched an application to track and reunite missing children in India. It's estimated that 180 children go missing each day in India, and many are never found. Bashpan, Bacho and Dolan's applications allowed parents and others uh, to post photographs of abandoned and missing children, and then make use of Amazon recognition to match the children's photographs against the report and details to, of course, track them back. Now, of course, let's take a look at last but not least, CoinJar. CoinJar is a digital currency exchange organization, and their mission is to put digital currency into the hands of millions of people globally with best-in-class products and, of course, a user-friendly web and mobile application. They implemented identity verification workflows to verify the IDs and maintain scalability, all the while delighting their customers. As a result, they were able to ensure financial compliance and, of course, security best practices while scaling their platform within five minutes during spikes in API requests. And just wanted to share the breadth and depth of Amazon recognition customers uh, more broadly. We only stated three particular use cases, but we have many more which you can find on our web page. Now, I'd like to welcome Mike back to the stage or virtual stage, as I, sh as I should say, to just with myself walk you through uh, a bit of an identity verification analysis summary. Mike, over to you. Sure, just to kind of recap, you know, evaluating these identity verification solutions um, is an important step in deploying one of these. And hopefully you see it's not super difficult, um, but you do want to use a large and diverse sample of real world images. That would be one of our sort of best practices. Having a human in the loop, right? basically uh, gives us the ability for a human to review specific decisions and edge cases, things that you expected to match that didn't match. And then finally, you know, because we are making decisions based on similarity, we want folks to remember, you got to weigh the trade-off between making decisions, right? Where you're going to reject more comparisons or accept, um, you know, the potential that two different people are the same person. And so we want to weigh the trade-offs between false rejection and false acceptance. Jesse, you want to talk about business benefits. Of course. So I think in order to kind of reap the benefits of, of Amazon recognition in the context of identity verification, some of the key business aspects of ensuring that you've analyzed your solution effectively is by ensuring that you define a very clear problem statement uh, where you're where you highlight what you're trying to address here. Um, and of course, look at providing uh, key success criteria and then align your stakeholders that will help you in this space. And of course, try to start small. There is no need to boil the ocean. Start with a small use case or a small example of the problem statement you're trying to address and do a little POC 
uh, with um, some budget to get you off the ground. Again, as we've mentioned, we have resources available to you, which we can share here in the next step section. You can try and go into our GitHub repository where you will find a myriad of architect diagram and of course, the affirmation template to get you started very quickly. You can of course also work with us um, if you have a complex problem and you're not quite sure where to start, you can reach out to myself or Mike and we, are, we will be more ha than happy to oblige. And of course, uh, you can find a partner. We have an extensive uh, list of partners that have a proven track record in delivering identity verification through Amazon recognition, and it will be more than happy to help you. With this, this marks the end of our session. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, Mike, for being my co-pilot here. I've really enjoyed your portion of the session. And I'd like to thank our guests who have listened in and participated in the comment section. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.